Hey, Z. Hello. Oh, good. I hear you good. All right. Because I've never done live with a headset before, so I can hear you and I can... You can hear me? Yep. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. So people are joining in. This is awesome. So for those who are here, welcome to day one of the Jammed In Sessions Mental Health Live. It's me and Z. Um, so we're going to have the conversation. Basically, I'm going to be asking questions and... um. If you do have the latest update of Instagram and you want to ask a question in this live, you're more than welcome to do so as well. It should be next to the comment box, but I know sometimes some people for some reason don't didn't see it yesterday when I was doing the live with Brandon. So um, it is what it is, but you know, that's what that is. So um, yeah, I guess we can just get started right now. So um, my first question, hang on, and we'll start it from here. So when you when people say mental health so what does that mean to you so mental health is like uh just taking care of your mental wellness a lot of people talk about like talking about their physical health and going to check up to make sure that like they're not sick with a cold or anything or if they do get sick with a cold what do you do you get like antibiotics or something right um, mental health is taking care of your brain essentially and making sure that like if you are sad for extended periods of time maybe you should see if you have depression or something or if you know that you you haven't been feeling good mentally like you want to make sure that you are not getting yourself to a place where it is so bad that you feel like you can't do anything and like yeah. and um she said sanity and I just want to point out that that is mostly just a term used in legal um in like the legal world now it's not really technically a term that we use to describe mental health or mental illness um or like insanity is not not supposed to use that word um and it's really only used in, when describing like um in court cases and stuff it's a really outdated term but yeah okay okay so um how would a person that so you said how basically you go to a place and you um basically try to see what's going on so let's say for example you said sad you go if you notice that for a long period of time and you go to get it checked out what like how i guess like how does that impact the person i guess I, I guess that's the question i'm my next question is like how does that impact the person once they find out like whether it's from your experience or somebody else you know like in your case how does that impact you as a person diagnoses can be incredibly validating i think uh, okay also, I just want to clarify that I am not a mental health professional at all. Uh, just someone who has dealt with their own, like, years of mental illness. And, um, yeah, so not a mental health professional. Just the, all of my opinions are my own. Just clarifying that. So, um, man. So, yeah, diagnoses can be really, really validating, um, especially in severe in a situation that where people are denying the reality that you're going through, um, that can be really harsh to hear. Like for years, I was told that my eating disorder wasn't a real eating disorder. Uh, Cause mostly they were like, you don't actually think you're fat, but it was all of the stuff that I didn't even want to share with them because it felt like, if I said that I, if I told them my truth, then they would look at me differently and still do things to invalidate the experience, even though I knew that there was something wrong. So finally, like a couple months ago or a couple of years ago, I finally got the diagnosis of an eating disorder and it just made me feel so like I wasn't wrong anymore. Um, it was incredibly validating and just really great, but not everyone is in the like position where they can safely get a diagnosis. 
Um, and I think that's also another really big thing that it takes a toll on you mentally and it, it's even worse if you're not in a safe place where it is um, okay to get a diagnosis. And a lot of people go undiagnosed with like depression for years um, because like you can, I guess it really matters if you want to actively take steps to reach that sort of mental healing. Um, but yeah, I think um, how Shades was asking how to gain our mental peace. Yeah, I was going to ask you that next question, but um, Shades asked it for me. <laughs> well, go ahead. Is that the next question then? Yeah, that was it. yeah. Because um, I do have some questions I wrote down, some questions I had in my mind so I wanted to ask. So um, it's funny because um, Shades and Sane kind of beat me to it because that was actually my next question as well. Um, okay, so I guess that is kind of subjective. Like it varies from person to person. Um, you kind of have to like assess what is causing you so much distress. Um, and man, that's like, there's not one way to be okay, really. And it really just depends on your circumstances. And like, if you're dealing with immense anxiety, maybe go to therapy and talk about it. If therapy doesn't work for you, look for things that you can ground yourself with. Long-term mental peace isn't really something that I can speak for because it is so unique to everyone, I think. No, no I definitely agree with that. Um, I was going to say, too, um, about the, 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 you know, to be safe. And I think a lot of times, too, it, it is this issue sometimes because when you're in an environment that, that's not safe, I believe sometimes the mental illness, the mental health can get worse, you know. Um, you know, when I when I was talking to you privately, um, I had mentioned how my upbringing, when I, like when I was growing up, um, I grew up in the Hispanic culture where you really couldn't talk about stuff like that. So because of those kind of environments, sometimes it makes it uncomfortable for somebody to go through where, okay, let me go try therapy. And the minute you tell somebody in your, in your social circle of that culture, that this is what that is, what this is, automatically they assume, oh, something's wrong, or oh, you have issues. And it's just like, no, um, and if I do, it's just, okay, but this is something I'm dealing with myself. I just need your support or whatever the case might be. But unfortunately, like, again, in my case, um, a lot of things going up for me was not allowed. I wasn't allowed to express emotion. I was conditioned to be like, okay, get over it and that's it, move on. And a lot of people don't realize how something like that could traumatize somebody in such a way that when you get older, it's like, okay. And then and then once you meet someone that does make the difference in your life, but then you think about something that happened before, it kind of makes it difficult to want to get the help that you need. So um, I, I guess, um, like, again, like for me, it was just, it was so difficult. So it's just because of this life we're doing now, I think this is when I'm starting to um, come to terms with some things in my life as well, you know? So I think that's very important. But what do you think, like for someone that goes through something like that, how would you think maybe a person could cope with something like that? So I think first we should address the, the issue of stigma and the way that society still views mental illness, um, which what you grew up with sounds really awful. And I'm sorry that you had to go through that. Um, everyone always talks about having a good support system, but very few people realize how difficult that is to obtain, especially if you are experiencing something and you are tired of being alone and you finally reach out to someone and they're like, hey, this is what I'm going through, only to have them sort of like shut the door in your face and just like end that friendship, end that relationship, whatever, then they're the for it. absolutely sucks. Um, you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable position by opening yourself up to that. And you should have the support that you went out to look for, but it's not always like that and that can be a really really isolating like really 
fucking isolating. Um, and it might make you hesitant to tell more people because of the stigma that exists in the world. And unfortunately, stigma is something like this particular stigma has built up over like decades and so long. Um, like I used to think that it was just a generational thing, but that's not really true because there is totally stigma in my generation and a lot of people who are just in denial about the existence of it. The one thing that I would say is to, if you can, keep speaking up and keep showing your experiences. Um, because the one way that we can silence the stigma is by giving it a voice, giving the intangible a voice. Um, if you keep on writing about it and making art about it and talking about it, even though it is a really difficult thing to talk about, right? we'll see that this is a reality. This is something that people actually experience. So, yeah. No, no, that, make, that makes sense. And, um, Okay, so I think I think the I mean before I can say I think I think I'm ready, you know, because again I, I think I'm ready to talk about what I was you know that I spoke to you about, um, and it, everything you said was just so spot on. Um, I mean, and I guess in my case there was always this thing where, like I, I was saying about uh, when I was growing up, you know, if you don't do this, you're not a man, or if you don't do this, you're not a man, or if you let a situation go less, then you're not a real man. You know, there was all these verbal abuse that I went through where. And I think a lot of them wasn't, I know not all of them were meant for harm, but it's traumatizing sometimes too. So again, um, just, you know, I, I've been through bullying as well. And um, so what I'm going to show people who are watching was something that I've struggled with for a long time. Um, I never knew how to address it. And again, it wasn't until I spoke to you. So I really thank you for this. Um, so when I was growing up, um, you know, I, I was in special ed, I was on psychiatric therapy, I was on medication, and there was always this label they put on me that I was, I had a, a, a learning disability, like that was the word that they always used around me. So, and just that alone, like for me to tell anybody this is what this is, like I think I told a few people growing up just or let's say if I got into a fight in school and I would use that, not as an excuse, but like, oh, well, this, this, that, and the third, automatically they would look at me like I was crazy or something was wrong with me. And yeah, I've been hospitalized and, and then they would increase the medication, you know, um, thinking pills like Redolin and Adderall, like all these things. Uh, another pill called Zyprexa, like there was all these pills I took and I felt like they made me worse, right? So even as I got older, in my 20s, I decided I'm not doing this anymore. I'm done. And I finally, you know, I did what I had to do. But I felt like maybe that should have ended there. Maybe I could have went somewhere else and it could have helped me in a better way. And I feel like I, I see myself certain certain things affecting my personality today because I, I definitely feel like because I did not get the proper help that I felt like I could have gotten, it was everything just went spiral out of control. So anyway, so I don't, I don't, I don't get too crazy about it. So for my whole entire life, so if you live in New York, um, they have these programs for like, and again, I hate using this word, like disabled people, like this is what they do. Like, I, and this is the thing that gets me upset because, so because of that word or that thing, so that, that makes me less of a person. I'm like, no, like, you know what I'm saying? But this is how people treat each other sometimes. And even that alone is just discomforting sometimes. And um, so anyway, in New York, they uh, do this thing. Um, they have programs. So if you're quote unquote disabled or whatever the case is, what, you know, it doesn't matter. They just generalize it to that word then you have certain privileges or certain programs to join in. So let's say you get SSI or, you know, stuff like that. So my mother had her own thing and I was diagnosed with my thing. And, you know, so I wasn't allowed to do a lot there. I wasn't allowed to have a job because God forbid I got a job. Then it will, look the, it will make the case look weird. And then 
they would take the money from that side. Like there was all this stuff that my dad would just not allow me to do. And then, you know, again, it's just mentally, physically, like, you know, and, and I struggled with identity even after I broke up with my first girlfriend. I struggled a lot with my self identity. But I don't know, like, I, okay, so am I this? Am I that? What am I? Like, who is this guy in the mirror? So, anyway, so I had this thing, this card for a long time. So, something told me to hold on to it when I finally decided to stop using it. So, if you live in New York, or I guess within the tri state area, they have these metro cards. So, they call them reduced fare metro cards, and they give it to people who have a disability i guess you know and i don't like using that word but it's just it's just, it's just what it says on the card and that label alone traumatized me for so many years you know but it was just so jerk. so this is the car i'm going to show so this is the metro card that they give you and this is so i, I crossed out my because my actual name was juan andes Morales, but i never used my full name so it's call me andy so I had to live with this, I'm going to say 27 to 20, 26 to 27 years of my life using this card. But this is how traumatizing it is. When I, uh, so let's say I'm hanging out with my friends, I would kind of hide the Metro card. So they, you know, so when I swipe it or I would wait till everybody went ahead of me and swiped the Metro card because I was too embarrassed by this. Uh, it's just so many things because I was never given proper information about what this is, what it really is all about. So it wasn't just a label. It's not just this. It's not just that. It is a whole bigger scope of things. So, so what I'm going to talk about now is, um, so I was diagnosed as a kid, as a child, with, uh, whew, well, this is kind of harder than I thought, but. Okay, yeah, so I was diagnosed with uh, schizotypal personality disorder. So that's all I knew. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what diagnostic was. All I know is that this is what I was labeled with, and this is what I had to deal with the rest of my life. So the only one I told my told that to was my cousin Jonathan, who um, very very great person, made a difference in my life a lot. You know, he was a little brother I never had. So you know, we would crack jokes. Like, oh, you got that hot, you know, just joking around. But I know he just meant that I just, because that's just our humor. But deep down inside, it would be like, okay, but I don't even know what that is. Like, this is what I knew I was called. This is what I had, you know? Mm -hmm. So I want to read what this is. And then I figure, hey, maybe you can give me your input on it. Or anyone here can give them the input on here. So if I get upset, it's because... I hate the words or the terminology they use to describe something like that because I feel like they use certain words to make a person feel less than a person. And I think that's what gets me upset sometimes about the mental, medical field where they make it seem like this person is less than another person. That's not what that is. But I'm going to read this. So it's called Schizotypal Personality Disorder. Schizotypal Personality Disorder is a mental disorder characterized by severe social anxiety thought disorder, paranoid ideation, derealization, trans, I'm sorry, transition psychosis, and often unconventional beliefs. People with this order feel extreme discomfort in maintaining close relationships with people and avoid forming them, mainly because the subject thinks that their peers harbor negative thoughts towards them. Peculiar speech mannerisms and odd modes of dress, and also symptoms of this. This oh, I'm sorry. Uh, symptom of this disorder are also symptoms of this disorder. Okay, those with STPD may react oddly in conversations, not respond or talk to themselves. They frequently interpret situ uh, situations as being strange or having unusual meaning for this. Paranormal and superstitious beliefs are common. People, such people frequently seek medical attention for anxiety and depression instead of their personality disorder. Schizotypal personality disorder occurs in approximately 3% of the general population and is more common on males. So when I read this, I had to really think to myself, okay, do I really do all these things? And and I struggled with even admitting the fact that, okay, this could be possibly something that I have. So 
as I, again, getting older and, and all this stuff, I could do two things, right? There's two things I can do with it. I can take this and drown myself in this and just let it bottle up inside me. Or I can take this, what I have, make it into a positive situation and be a light for someone that maybe struggles with the same thing that I have. And, um, you know, for those who know me, they know I believe in God and stuff like that. So, like, um, okay, I'm, I'm not preaching religion or anything. I'm just telling from my experience and my experience only. Um, you know, I've, I've had God tell me, you know, you keep hiding this, then how can you be a life for someone when you're not willing to really touch, you know, touch on this stuff? And I think that's what just, just a lot of things that we all go through. And I think when I first spoke to you about it, I think that's when I came to realize that, you know what, like I'm tired of just, you know, just holding this in. And it's funny because as we're speaking, I actually feel like this weight finally lifted off my shoulder because I could finally talk about it. And it's just, um, you know, it's just one of those things, again, like, and I, I'm still trying to understand this whole thing. I'm still trying to learn this whole scope of things. But I realized, you know what, it's what I have, but it's not who I am, if that makes sense. I could take this and I'm going to be a light for someone else that struggles that with this exact same thing. And, you know, I hope that whoever's listening to this, if you're struggling with this like I have, then hopefully this is the window that you need to say, hey, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Ooh, okay, that, that was, wow, that was very difficult. You did a really good job. Proud of you. Thank you. So, um, whew, sorry, just, uh, you're okay. Yeah. Just didn't know if I could even talk about that. So it's just, I thought, okay, it's nothing. But then when I finally come talk about it, it's a lot difficult than what it seems. And I think this is exactly what you're trying to say as well. It's not as easy as it sounds, you know? It can be really difficult to admit something that we've been hiding for so long. Um, especially something as big and life changing as a diagnosis that has shaped our experiences and affected the way we see things and the way that people see us. So you did a really good job. Thank you. I, I thank you for this because um, you inspired me to do this. And again, like, Honestly, I don't think if we were doing this, I don't think I ever would have talked about it, even though I've had time for, okay, I was going to do the video, I'm going to finally talk about it, but then I always held back. So I think this was the push that, that I needed. So thank you for doing this, and thank you for, um, thank you. Thank you. I don't know what else to say. This is just, You're good. I guess, yeah, it's just very uplifting, because I do feel like a weight was lifted off my shoulders, which is good. I think I needed this weight lifted off already, so. I'm glad. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. That it can be really cathartic. Really cathartic. So. Oh, all right. So, that guy just, oh, man. <laughs> so, um, I know you and I talked about some things, too, that you wanted to talk about specifically as well. So, if you want to just touch on that right now and just take it from there. I'm yeah. only making my, uh, yeah, I'm just too, oh, I'm still trying to process this. <laughs> Don't it, me. I'm actually going to, um, I saw that Shades um, asked a question earlier, so I'm going to answer that. Okay. He asked how to restrain the triggers and face all of the pan like face at that panic time. So I'm, Guessing the question was to how to deal with triggers and panic, um, which is a very um, good question because triggers and panic, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, so when you're dealing with a trigger, so a trigger is something that, tr that brings up a series of unwanted thoughts. They can be flashbacks, they can be anxiety, they can be just really unpleasant body experiences. Ooh, those are bad. Um, and the panic that follows is you can't, they're kind of unwarranted. So a trigger can be like a place, it can be a word, it can be something that you're being called. 
it can be a smell, like anything sensory can be a trigger. Um, and they're all very like personal to the traumatic event that may have happened. Um, and so um, panic, the panic attacks that follow, ooh, those are hard. But if you have any sort of grounding techniques that are familiar to you that you know will help you when you're panicking, um, utilize those. I have a grounding toolbox um, and it has things like, it's like this little like timer thing that like I can watch the sand go down and it gives me something to focus on. There is like, uh, what is it? Like something soft, like a blanket or like a flannel or something that I can like play with with my hands really grounding and there's like i think like some lavender or something like a lavender sachet something to smell um and it like really helps me ground the another thing that you can do if you don't have like a grounding like box of tools is the five four three two one grounding technique um which is to identify five things that you can see four things you can touch three things you can hear i think two things you can smell and one thing you can taste. Um, and if you're in a room, try to identify those things and it'll help you really like become aware of your surroundings again, because grounding is essentially a mindfulness thing. Um, when you feel like you're panicking and like you can feel it, your chest getting all tight and you feel like you're gonna faint you really need something to focus on. And so you need to be mindful of what's happening because when you're panicking, you're not really being mindful of anything. Uh, your, your mind actually may feel like it's like disappearing. So um, yeah, that grounding technique really helps um, try it next time you're panicked. Um, other things would be to like, if you can, I know that in the moments of like a panic attack, it can be kind of like paralyzing. I know because last night I had one and I was like literally curled up on the ground. I couldn't do anything for like, I think it was like half an hour or something. Sometimes you just have to write it out. Um, know that it will pass. It will end eventually and just feel it. It's difficult as fuck and unpleasant but you will get through it wow wow that's damn that's crazy like in a good way like wow like it's um it's interesting because you said something very interesting about the the triggering part um i know for me a lot of things trigger me and again i think the first step was always the fact that okay now that i've admitted this Okay, so now things are coming to light, if that makes sense. Um, there's a lot of things that triggered to this day. Um, I think also the verbal abuse that I talked about earlier. Um, so let's say if you're giving me advice about something. Um, so it's not what you say, but it's how, not you, I mean in general. Um, it's not what you say, but it's how you say it. So unfortunately for me, I was never taught the difference between someone really genuine and someone that's just pointing the finger being judgmental and excuse my language and just being a real dick. Um, so let's say if my dad tried to give me advice about something. So because his expressions was always the same when he was serious and sincere, I couldn't tell the difference. Same thing with my older brother. So when I went out to the world to work, I have a difficult time of trying to understand the difference with that so when my wife sometimes she just naturally comes off a certain way because that's just how she is you know and, and she really is just being genuine but because that something she did triggered something in here and reminded me of something and something with like i don't know if this makes sense something in here made that thing get upset so then i got upset at her even though she really wasn't trying to do that mm -hmm. if that makes sense and then, oh, if I'm by myself, and this happens a lot when I'm alone, where I could be here sitting down and then my mind is racing with thoughts and it's somehow an old memory will pop up, but I don't remember it 
vaguely. I, I, it's like I vaguely remember the memory, but then I wonder, did I really go through that memory or was that just an imagination thing or just a scenario playing in my head of something that I thought could have happened and not happened? And, and it's just interesting because some things will trigger sometimes. Um, but the trigger part really hit me hard right now as you're saying that. So that's why as... As you see right now, now I'm thinking and thinking too much. And now you see that now my mind is just all over the place now. But this is just, again, an example of just something I go through where I'm just trying to see this, the overthinking pattern, the, the overthinking. Thought spiral. Wait, say that again. Anxiety, thought spiral. Okay. Like, so, again, what you're, what yeah. you're starting is kind of just anxiety. And um, thought spiraling is sort of when you start, when you say like, oh, what if this happens? And then that what if ends up like, and you just keep going on the what if, like what if this, but what if they actually do this? But what if this will happen if I do that? And thought spiral, you know, mm, that okay. you're deciding like overthinking and overanalyzing, thought spiral. Wow. Well, wow, that's okay. That's good to know. Cause again, I didn't even know. Again, I'm I'm still learning. I'm still learning this. Um, okay. Yeah. Years no. So, so. Please help me. I'm still. Wait. What? The years of therapy for me. Wow. No, you know it's crazy because I used to go to therapy. I just stopped going because I just didn't like the experience, you know. But I think maybe I should have pressed on harder and went somewhere else to do therapy maybe it could have been a lot better but because i never did so i would never know you know if that makes sense yeah oh you're just looking at the comments right um okay so um and sometimes this would happen like i'll say something and then something eventually this is the best analogy i can give you you ever you ever played a, cons a video cassette yes <laughs> You know how sometimes, you know how sometimes when you're watching the video cassette and then it just gets stuck, like the tape gets stuck somewhere and then you can't take the damn thing out of the VCR? Yeah. That's what happens to my mind sometimes. Or if I'm listening to a record and then it just spins, it just spins, it, it does that a lot and I start stuttering like crazy and then I'm like, okay, wait. I feel like my mind's about to fry. And I have to be like, okay, whoa, let me stop. Let me stop. So now I wonder. So I know about my schizotypal personality disorder, but I wonder, now this is my next question. Can a person, is it possible for a person to have more than one diagnostic? That's my next question. Yes. Comorbidities are incredibly common. Like in which way? I mean, if you don't mind me asking, like in which way? Is, again, I, I don't know a lot about this so i'm learning as we're talking to be honest with you okay so um well i don't know why this is a thing but it's a thing um a lot of people think that you cannot have a physical a physical disability and mental illness like the two tend to be like very separate um like the physically disabled community exists here and the mentally ill community exists over here and the two can't intersect when in reality a lot of people who have physical disabilities most likely also have some sort of mental illness um so that's one example of the comorbidity like um another one is anxiety and depression tend to be diagnosed together um just because if you have one you likely also have symptoms of the other one um mm, or okay. there are some mental illnesses that like come with comorbidities what the fuck hold on um one second my mom just texted me <laughs> no it's all good it's all good you still alive? And I'm like, yes, I am actually still alive. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, ah, it's so, okay. <laughs> uh, comorbidities. Um, what is it? Like, anxiety, social anxiety. There is really, unfortunately, no limit to how many diagnoses 
can exist within one person. Um, dissociative disorders can exist along with mood disorders like derealization or depersonalized DPDR with depression, social anxiety, and regular depression, bipolar disorder with anxiety. I mean, yeah. Okay. It's not common for people to have multiple diagnoses. In fact, I wouldn't say that you're lucky if you only have one diagnosis, but in a way you kind of are. No, so, but I, I don't know now because again, I'm learning as we're speaking and that's what I'm saying because I'll go through certain things that is not what it says here, but I'll notice little things that I'm like, okay, is this normal? And then I'll look up certain things and then it makes me wonder, okay, so and that's why I asked you that question because I feel like, okay, even though this is what I was diagnosed by a doctor, let's get to mm -hmm. some personality disorder, but I see myself, like, for example, uh, and I remember when I spoke to Amanda a while back, because she was talking about, P uh, what was it, PTSD and OCD and stuff like that, you know, and I started looking up certain things, and there's certain things of that, of those things that I actually do myself, and I wonder, but I, even though I was never diagnosed by a doctor, but I sometimes think I do have some kind of PTSD of some sort, because some things will trigger something where I'll get very like post dramatic in a way, but not in a craziness. Like, like let's say someone from a, like, uh, like if you, let's say it's someone from uh, from the army or something, and because they go through a lot, for example, and then not all the times, but a lot of times people who have PTSD that come from the army, for example, or anything military based, they go through a lot of craziness. And even though I've never been in the Marines or anything like that, but I see myself getting certain things or when somebody does something that reminds me of my ex-girlfriend or something or something someone that looks like someone i used to know and it's not them um I, I know these are weird examples but it's just it would remind me of a bad memory of that person or something and it feels and, and my heart will start racing like oh my gosh that but then it really wasn't them or something or the ocd thing um it's funny because pe people make jokes about that all the time oh you got ocd but then i didn't know that was an actual real thing to be honest with you i didn't know that was an actual thing called ocd i thought that was just some joke that someone made up and that was it mm -hmm. so it gets confusing so medically i was diagnosed with schizophrenia personality disorder but when i again and that's one thing about me when i notice little things i try to type up things even though i feel like i drive my wife crazy with it and i feel bad but it's just I need to know, you know, and I wonder if I do have, the, have other stuff, what are they? Should I go to a doctor to see for sure? Like, you know, and it, it's just the fear, like you said before, it's just the fear of it, of, oh, what are they going to say? What are they going to do? You know, and I'm just the kind of guy, I don't know if I'm ready to go back on medication. My wife has, um, she, it's not as bad, thank God, but she, she deals with, um, a postpartum because after she, my, mm -hmm. my son was born, you know, she yeah. went through that. And they gave her some medications as well, even though she felt she felt like she, it was making her feel worse. So she stopped taking them, and then we just started to take like, natural remedies instead. And she felt like that made her a little bit better. But it's just, you know, with all this stuff. So with that being said, I guess my next question is: Do you think not all, but do you think some medications are good? Do you think some medications are bad? Do you think sometimes because there's some people who I know have these. Um, mental illnesses and they just refuse to take medication um so i guess if you want to elaborate what why you think or what you think about that basically what you think about that and why do you think that is so one of my favorite phrases that my friends have used past therapists have used i use it um if you can't create your own neurotransmitters store thought is fine and I like that because sometimes our brains just can't give us what we need. Um, okay. If you need medication, by all means, explore that route. Um, there are a lot of medications for everything. Like depression, there's like a list of maybe eight off of that that I can think of that would help. 
Um, but because everyone's brain chemistry is so unique to them, it'll take a bit of time and searching to find the right combination. Um, I personally have been on medication for mom medication now, but prior to that, I was on it for a few years. I think from the time I was like uh, 15 to 19, I think. Um, and it was really beneficial, but it did take some time to figure out what it, what worked and what didn't. Um, I know that there's also like a lot of like, oh, you're on medication. You must be really crazy. No, no. If you need it, if it's going to help you take it, explore that. Um, there's absolutely no shame in medicating your mind. And maybe you may be worried about like the side effects or like feeling numb like that you may not be able to create that was one of my fears because i remember on one of the medications that i tried i just couldn't feel anything and i said this is almost worse than feeling everything because i feel everything very very intensely and i was worried about that um but it kept me from getting to those really, really, really dark places. And I was able to function more. And I think that it's really a balance between functioning and being like getting your tasks done in your day to day and oh, hey, fun. Sorry. Um, something just came out. Um, so getting, oh, word. <laughs> getting your everyday uh, tasks done and feeling like you can um because no one wants to be in the darkness forever really like on the medication that i just recently started i feel happier like i i feel better it's not all darkness and it's made me see that there is a lot of light still left in the world and it just made the day is just that bit more bearable. And it's not like this huge life changing thing. It's like, it happens with work. You get as much as you put into it. Like you get as much out of it as you put into it, I guess. Um, like I've been in therapy since late December and I've been on medication for about, oh God, like almost a month now. And I'm wow. taking the steps to make my mental health as good as it can be right now. And yes, I still have bad days, but I feel better about it. And I couldn't tell you that six months ago. I really couldn't. I, yeah. So if oh, you wow. need education, explore that. Don't be ashamed of it because there's really no room for shame when it comes to medicating. And again, like I said, there are some that work for someone and what may work for me may not work for you. Right. Um, like, I know that people have like, they bond over it really in a weird way. They're like, oh, right. I tried this one, it made me feel this way. And like, again, it will just show you that a lot of people take medication and a lot of people like, are willing to talk about it if you need to feel like you're not alone because it really does that. Right, right, right. And I think that that's very important. And I and one thing I got out of all this is the fact that I think it's the form of community that you are surrounded with that makes it easier and it makes the life around you more brighter, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so my next question is this, and and you know, and it just it, I I didn't know what else to ask it until so I said, let me just hear what you're saying. And so the medication, right? In your opinion, do you believe when when the doctors, you know, prescribe medication, are they meant to help you in a way where okay, like let's say I take it now, is it to help you in a way where eventually you don't have in a way where you won't have to rely on that ever again? Or is it a lot different or more complex than that? Or like, what do you think in, in your, in your, in your view? I think it really depends. Um, for example, if you are taking a like 
medication targeted to help with panic attacks. Right. Uh, benzos are, are fast acting usually, and they are meant to be taken sort of in the moment that you're experiencing a panic attack. Eventually, I would hope that you don't need to take to continue taking them, like maybe you figure out a way to manage your panic attacks without medication, if that's something you want to do. Or maybe you remove the thing causing the panic attacks, which sometimes you can do because, again, anxiety, sometimes it can be situational based. Um, if you're going through a very high stress situation for like an extended period of time and you just have to get through that, like, I don't know, if you're studying for a major exam and that exam is causing you so much anxiety, you can't cope without medication, then, and you take it, and then as soon as the exam is over, maybe you stop experiencing those panic attacks. That would be one example of, like, possibly stopping it. Um, but for things that are more, like, long-lasting, like depression, maybe that is something that you might have to stick with and take for, I don't know, how long, as long as you are alive, I guess, which I would hope to be is a very long time. Um, right. But again, it's really up to you and how much work you put into it, but also just your brain chemistry. Like, some people just have to take medication their entire lives, and that's okay. Um, that's okay. No, amen. Like, I'm just absorbing everything you're telling me. And again, uh, it's it's been such a blessing. Um, I'll be honest with you, um, because I did have other questions, but you answered a lot of the questions before I even <laughs> asked it to you. So, so I'm like, I really don't have any more questions. Um, I guess if I guess um, we have like what, like 13 minutes left, but we still have time. Uh, if you want to go another hour, that's fine with me too. It's up to you. Um. And uh, now, I guess, I guess, if there's um, other things in your mind that you also wanted to talk about, um, or like, let's say, is there any topics you think that surrounds mental health that maybe you believe a lot of people do not talk about that you want to talk about in here? That's that's you're more than welcome to as well. Okay. Um. Let's see. At yeah, let's finish up this hour, and then I. Actually, I have to, I'm going to take a break before I have something at 2 o'clock. Um, but, yeah, um, I would say finding the things that bring you joy, hold on to them. Um, yeah, if you can, mental health is a huge topic. It is a huge topic. It is very difficult to talk about sometimes. Um, and if you've never talked about it before in your life, it can be extremely daunting. It might feel like you're hiding like this really big secret. Don't let the fear of being judged stop you from speaking out because you will find your people eventually. You will find your people and I'm sorry for the rejection and hurt that you might experience when you tell people these things, it's not fair. It's, you might lose some people, to be honest. You might lose some people, but you will also find your people. And it is my hope that you feel safe. Um, I think that's also something else to address. Safety is absolutely huge and so important. Um, if you know me, I always end everything with, like, before I leave, I say, stay safe. Um, because physical safety and mental safety, they're two different things that I would hope ideally fall under the category of being safe in general. But right, right. just because you're safe physically, like, if you are in a house and with people who make you feel safe, you may not feel safe mentally. Um, and that is something to be mindful of and to be aware of. If you're ever feeling unsafe mentally, like if your mind is just going to those really dark places, 
see what you can do to make those mental spaces safe as well. Um, whether that's like surrounding yourself with, um, like watch what you're, who you're following on Instagram and social media that can greatly affect your mental, um, health and your mental safety. Don't follow anyone who might upset you, I guess. Um, fill your physical space with things that make you happy. But also just be aware of your own mental safety. Because you don't ever want to feel mentally unsafe. That's one of the worst feelings in the world. Yeah. Oh, man. Like or- my sister, um, because she struggles a lot with anxiety. So she takes all these medications. And long story short, she, um, uh, you know, because she was married. And unfortunately, her husband just couldn't. She, he just wasn't a good support system. That's what it came down to when he left or whatever. But again, even things like that just makes you wonder, like, okay, but now if I meet someone else and I, I tell this person, hey, this is what I struggle with, then the thought comes to mind, damn, but maybe he might not want to be with me anymore because I have this. Maybe he might not want to deal with me anymore because, of a, because I have A, B, C, D, or E because now you're thinking about something that happened in the past not knowing if the future is going to be the same way, you know, and I think that's definitely something that, you know, unfortunately it's very unsafe because it's just the not knowing I feel makes it worse too sometimes because it's like, damn, you know, like when are, when are we going to catch a break, you know, and it's, and it makes the person feel less than, and then that's not the case either, you know, and it's just, it, it just sucks. It sucks. You know, that this is what people have to go through. Um, I've heard sto- like I'll give I'll give you an example um, of how serious it gets sometimes. Um, there was this pastor, right? His name was Jared Wilson, very well known pastor, and he was a mental health. Uh, what's the word? A- advocate? Am I saying that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So after I don't know how long, something happened, and he started tweeting weird things, saying something like. Jesus doesn't heal mental illness. Like he just wrote a whole bunch of multiple times and people were getting worried. Next thing you know, he committed suicide. But it just comes back to when we don't know how to cope with some things. And like you said, the, the safeness and the space and all that stuff, that it can become very difficult to deal with, you know? I would also like to... Um... First of all, wow, that's really, really devastating to hear. Um, the terminology committed suicide is a very outdated term. Um, we like to use the phrase completed suicide. Okay. Um, because committed refers to a time when suicide was a crime and something that was punishable by law. Ah, uh, okay. Um, it's not anymore. Thank God. Um, but there are, yeah, suicide as a whole, like attempts, suicide attempts, just as serious as um, completing suicide. So, okay. And there's a difference, really. But um, yeah, I just wanted to make a note of that. No, no, thank you, because I, I didn't even know that. So again, I, I'm learning as we speak, you know, and again, I really appreciate you for that. I've learned so, I've learned so much already. Uh, it's, it's, it's very comforting to know that, you know, there's this, there's this sense of safeness after all in my life, you know? <laughs> so, um, so, so I would say, wait, so I would say completed suicide. That's what I would say. Yeah. Wow. It's great. Damn. And it sucks that someone has to go through something like that. Like, I was always that guy that, like, if I can be that light where I can prevent the person from doing it, fine. But I understand we're not Superman. But then I beat myself up because I wasn't able to do something. And I felt like maybe I could have done something. And that was not the case, you know? Don't beat yourself up for not being able to stop someone. Um... I've had a few friends die by suicide, and it has been really difficult because there is a lot of that survivor guilt there. Right. Uh, there's some. There's a few of my friends in our circle who 
say, oh, it's a miracle that I've made it to 21 or 25 or whatever. Um, because a lot of the students actually think that we would make it. Um, Cause when you experience those things as like a kid or like even in your early twenties, it, it can be really daunting and um, you don't really plan for the future because you think you're not really gonna be there to see it. Um, right. But when you are the one that's left standing and your friends have taken their own lives, you feel kind of, there is that natural tendency to go inwards and beat yourself up. It's not your fault. It is not your fault at all. There is nothing you should have done. There's nothing you could have done. And by that I mean, always do everything you can. But in those moments leading up to when that person has decided that they are going to end their lives and in like the moments right before they're going to, I have to believe that there is nothing that can stop them because pain is just too fucking insurmountable. And there is um, always, of course, if you can do everything you can to make sure that they know that you're there. Um, I also, I feel like I'm going to lose some people here, but don't ever fucking call the cops on your mentally ill friends. Don't ever fucking call the cops on them. Um, the police, <laughs> sorry, the police, no, it's all the good. police in the United States are not in a position to help mentally ill people. They're not trained properly. This is how people get fucking shot. Um, yeah. yeah, don't fucking do it. Don't fucking do it. Um, if you are concerned about a friend who may, who, like, you're worried that they may die by suicide, go over to their fucking house. If you can't go to their house, call them, call people you know who can reach them. Right. Just don't fucking call the cops. Yeah, I've heard stories like that. Yeah, that that is crazy. Like, you know, I, like in New York, um, before I, I this is a long time ago, but back in the days, I, I don't know how long back in the days before De Blasio became the mayor, there used to be this rule. You know, obviously, if there's a mentally disabled or mentally ill person, uh, basically who who's just not right, whatever, then you are allowed to call the police and then they go and take them to the hospital, whatever. Now, de Blasio changed that. So basically, as long as they're not disturbing anybody, then there's nothing you can do about it. But that's just New York. I don't know if that's everywhere. I know in New York, that's just the rule as far as the New York City mayor. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's just nothing good can come from calling the cops in America. Right. Uh, or very rarely does anything good happen from calling the cops in America. I'm really sorry. I'm probably going to lose a lot of people here, but yeah. You know. No, it's a, listen, at the end of the day, like, you know me, I I don't care. At the end of the day, we're just speaking the truth. If you can't handle it, then it is what it is. Um, that's why I, I, I like truth. So that's the reality of it. Uh, we have a couple of seconds left. I'm just, so I'll use this to say this. Are you, you want to go another hour or is it you? I have to de Wait, what? I need Wait, to, that again? I need to go. So. Okay. All right, cool. So, Z, thank you so much for doing this with me. And um, talk to you soon. And I guess have fun with Robin on Monday and have fun with Ash on Tuesday. Thank you thank so much you. for this. Yeah. It's been good talking to you. Yes. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye.